Uh, here we go with the Frankie Flowers Garden Q and A on uh, Sunday, June the fifth, twenty twenty two. How is everybody today? I'm just got myself all set up here and prepared. Um, how are you? How's your garden growing? Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Frank Virginia, aka Frankie Flowers, of City TV's Breakfast Television. You can see me Monday through Friday on BT, where I'm wild about weather, passionate about plants. Yeah, I talk plants on the show as well as each and every day. I give you your weather forecast. If you're wondering where I got my background from, uh, four-time best-selling garden author, uh, won a bunch of different awards from garden design to being a garden communicator of the year from Landscape Ontario. As well, my family business has two garden centers, one in Bradford, one in Barrie. They're called Bradford Greenhouses. Yeah. And I come here each and every week to uh, chat with you to find out what's growing and going on in your garden and try to help your garden a little bit better for this season. Each and every week, we try to get you guys growing a little bit better out there. Hey, good morning from Tottenham. There's a good morning already from Tottenham, says Liz. Good morning to you as well. Uh, we have another shout out. Good morning as well from TJ. Good morning, guys. Hey, the one thing I want to get into uh, right away this morning is I've been getting lots of questions about people's hydrangeas. Mostly they're Annabella's, PG hydrangeas, incredible limelight hydrangeas. And what people have been noticing, and I'm going to share my screen here, is they have been noticing what is common and actually happens often when it comes to hydrangeas at this time of the year. They are starting to notice a curl on the leaf. And that there is indeed a hydrangea leaf curl. Uh, that inside is an insect. So if you were to take a look and you were to go through and take a look and start to a little closer look in, you start to notice some webbing and a caterpillar that sits in there. And that caterpillar will go on to kind of mow down and have a little bit of fun with your hydrangea. Uh, it's visibly uh, unattractive. Uh, best thing in what I've done in the past to just kind of remedy this is I've actually just gone along with a pair of pruners or a pair of scissors and snip those little pods off, put them in a bag, tied that bag off and thrown it in the garbage. Still have lots of blooms. Uh, the other option that you have as well is that you can apply BTK. BTK is a bacillus thurgentis. The only thing is, is with these pods, how these pods are wrapped, it actually protects that little caterpillar inside. So in order for BTK to work very well, you almost have to pull the pods apart. But my recommendation is just to cut them off and then throw them in a bag and this happens pretty much every year. Every year, it's pretty often that it does happen. So that's a little bit about the uh, the hydrangea leaf curl. I've gotten probably six to eight different emails on that topic this week. So that's when I know things are happening in your garden. Once I start seeing the common chats, the common emails, I'm like, oh, that bug has come. Uh, there's Diane that's saying good morning as well from Wasaga Beach. Enjoy your day. Hey, it's a beautiful day here, by the way. Uh, we got another good morning as well from Penetang. Enjoy your Sunday. I uh, want to give a shout out as well to uh, something we'll be doing tomorrow on breakfast television. Tomorrow at Yorkdale. And as you know, I do work with Yorkdale quite a bit. Uh, we are going to be building and installing again the community garden Elevated Eats. Elevated Eats with a goal to elevate food choices in Toronto for Toronto's hungry and as well food education. So we'll be planting that garden alongside of the team at Scott's Miracle Grow. They're going to come help. The team at Yorkdale is going to come help. Uh, I'll be there live all morning with breakfast television. So check that out. If you want to know more about Elevated Eats, you can just email me, frankie at frankieflowers.com, and I'll give you that information. This is the third community garden that I've installed so far this spring. Uh, it's a passion of mine. I think if we can teach people how to garden and actually give people better food, we're going to have... Uh, better results, better communities overall. Uh, we got another hello from Lois. Good morning, frankly, a lovely morning from Stratford. Stratford's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, here's a question, I think. Hi, Frankie, how do I kill stinging nettle? Help, a stinging nettle is actually a medicinal plant. We actually talked a little bit about stinging nettle in my book, Power Plants. Boom. Uh, the only thing about stinging nettle is it stings. Indeed, when you go to grab that stinging nettle, it actually will cause a rash. So if you've ever grabbed a weed out of your garden and you develop a real itchy, like almost an immediate itch, that is stinging nettle. Why does stinging nettle do that? That's stinging nettle's ability to protect itself against things that will eat it. Uh, to get rid of stinging nettle, it does take some hand removal. If it's a young weed that's just starting to pop up and it's in full sun, you can take full strength vinegar and that will burn, but make sure that vinegar doesn't touch anything else. Uh, you can use... 
in some of the areas that are badly affected. You can use a non-selected herbicide that are available at garden centers that are Health Canada approved. An example of one of those is Roundup. Uh, but hand removal is the best. Wear gloves when you do it and then mulch thereafter. That's probably the best thing. Stinging nettle actually grows in rich soils. So it's an indication that you actually have really good soil quality. Uh, Deb Kirby has a question. Good morning, Deb. Hi, Frankie. Is it too early to apply a succulent application of Grubby Gone? I know some dug up patches on my lawn. I did one application in early May. So if you did that in early May, uh, I would wait for, an, I would wait, to, wait till mid June. So wait another week to do that application. A reminder with Grub Be Gone, the key about Grub Be Gone is the lawn should be wet before you're applying the Grub Be Gone on and then a good rainfall and or wet the lawn, water the lawn thereafter. That's key. That early May application would have taken care of those uh, grubs that have made their way to the surface to eat the roots of your lawn. And now there will be additional grubs that are there. So that's exactly an application. But if we wait just a little bit, just maybe a week, uh, that'll be an excellent time to do an application for you guys at that time. Um, we got good morning from Bolton this morning. That's Mary Ann. Good morning to you as well. Uh, good morning as well this morning from Manitou Line, where it's the best pay, play, place, where is the best place to store leftover seeds? So if you do, so this is the thing, right? So let's say that we're seeding a row of uh, radishes, a row of spinach, uh, and we have some leftover seeds. Uh, we can use those later on in the season after we pull out that row of radishes. We can then wait till late August and sow another line of radishes and or spinach that are down for second crops that we can get. Uh, also during the season, after you cut your lettuce and things like that, you're going to have space in your garden. So then you can actually use the seeds there. Best place to, to store seeds is in a cool, dry, dark space. So what you can do, best place to put them in is in a paper envelope. That paper envelope then can go into a Ziploc container or a Ziploc, uh, even a Ziploc bag. And then anywhere that's dark and a little bit cool in your home is the best place for that to store. Seeds can store for multiple years. Indeed, they can. But the viability, the ability for them to germinate, germinate will diminish year after year. So that's the best place to store them. The reason why we're putting them in a paper envelope is any moisture that would be on that seed, that little bit of paper in the envelope will draw that moisture out. Uh, the reason why we want it to go into a dark space is we want it to think it's dormant. So we want it to stay dormant. And by being cool, it'll stay dormant as well. So there you go. Um, here we go with another question this morning. Last fall, I thought my rhubarb had root rot. So I dug it up and found it wasn't root rot. Okay, cleaned up the roots, planted it, doing beautiful. Can I pick the rhubarb this year? I have large stalks and leaves. I would definitely go ahead and pick the rhubarb this year. If you want to leave it uh, just for it to root in and to do better, but if it's doing and it's a vigorous plant, it's doing well, it has lots of leaves, those leaves on that plant are what giving energy back to the roots. So if that's ample and there's good growth, go ahead. <clears throat> just going to drink some coffee here. Mm. If you go to, um, just the reason why I'm wearing a ball cap today, had a little bit of a late night last night. Had some fun with some uh, high school friends that I've grown up with. Uh, we went to a superhero party, uh, which was a lot of fun to celebrate the success of my friend Dave Hudson's uh, family business, which is Spectre Aluminum. They've been doing really well. Family, little family success story that started with nothing and actually is doing great. So it's kind of fun. If you want to see what I dressed up as, what superhero I was, there you go. I'm, I try to be a superhero every day, a superhero of your garden to help save the garden and to help protect all those plants that are out there. Um, yeah, superhero Frankie Flowers. Tracy says, good morning from Brecon. Hey, Brecon, Ontario. It's too late to split my bleeding heart or ornamental grasses. They're taking over my garden. You know, the bleeding heart, uh, so we if they're taking over your garden and your garden is too full, and this is a problem at this time, I would go ahead and do, and just basically take some sections out. So take a sharp spade and just go in and take a section out. That main plant won't be harmed by you taking that section out. However, that new division may have a little bit of a struggle, but we're going through this week, temperatures around the mid to uh, mid to low twenties, overnight lows of 10 degrees. We have rain on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. So not a bad week to do it. Um, those guys, they're a little bit more finicky, but once again, if they're taking, if they're really kind of causing you issue, I would go ahead and do it. Key is, is to use a, something like a quick start fertilizer, like a miracle Grow quick start fertilizer, which is a transplant fertilizer to reduce that shot and really make sure that you're doing some good watering thereafter. Cheryl Ross says, good morning, Frankie, and a good morning to you as well, Cheryl. Uh, we also have Donna. Good morning, Donna. How are you? 
Last year, we got lots of apricot, uh, apricots. Forgive me. We got lots of apricots. But this year, not one blossom. The leaves are curling. Why? So leaf curl is an indication of a disease and or insect. The lack of blooms can be that that plant, uh, seeing the winter and or fall, it went into some stress. And by going into stress, it may not even set a bloom this year because it wants to replenish itself and actually get itself stronger. By putting a bloom and putting fruit on, that would actually put more energy to the bloom and the fruit, which would cause a stress. So first thing we have to do is to find out what that leaf curl is. Is it a disease and or insect? If you want to see if it's an insect, just take a white piece of paper from your printer and you're going to lay that white piece of paper on a table, maybe outside. Take the leaf and start to pull the leaf apart. If you see any insects that kind of fall into that paper, then it's an insect problem. If that's not the case, it's a disease problem. Um, we can spray a fungicide for disease at this time of the year, but mostly what's going to be most important is to keep that uh, that fruit tree well watered and even do a fertilizer application and then next spring a dormant spray kit and then in the fall though when those leaves drop we clean up all those leaves so we need to figure out whether it is uh, a disease and or an insect issue and probably the reason why it didn't set a flower was that it was already under stress and that stress could have been a result of maybe some late disease that it had last season or even just the severity of winter that i went through um Another question this morning. Vicky, good morning, Frankie. How do you stop squirrels from eating my my bedding and hanging flowers? Vicky, okay. So there's a couple different things. Um, they're employed by garden centers. We send them out so that they eat all your things so you have to buy more. It's a joke. Sometimes I think I'm funny. Sometimes you probably you probably don't think I'm funny. Okay, um, so one thing is, is there is Animal Be Gone. So Animal Be Gone is a product that you can spray on your ornamental plants, not your edibles, because it will leave a residual taste on them that makes them taste bad so that the squirrels and things like bunnies won't eat them. Train behavior. Another thing that I've had success with is just doing a top dressing around the areas with a pelletized chicken manure. That has uh, sometimes repelled them because they just don't like the smell. So we're always trying to figure out what they don't like to see, what they don't like to taste, what they don't like to touch, what they don't like to hear, kind of make that environment not that great for them. Um, next thing that you can do, is, of course, is put chicken wire around those areas, but then that becomes unsightly, doesn't look good at all. Uh, another thing is, is on the far end of your property, you could put a squirrel feeder down. That'll keep them busy and keep them away from your bedding plants and your hanging baskets. So those are the options. So you have animal be gone. You have the pelletized chicken manure. You can either fence around the area and if you can't beat them, you feed them. There you go. Um, here we go. Another question as well from Caroline. What is the best method to store unused grass seed and do they expire? So the unused grass seed, kind of the same idea. Paper bag, if you have a paper bag, you can even do it. A paper bag then into a pail. It could go into your garage because your garage is dark and fairly cool during the summer months. Uh, the seed viability over time will lose its uh, viability to germinate, but it can last year over year. But the seed is best when it's fresh, so to speak. Uh, overseeding your lawn, I just wouldn't do it once. I would actually do it a couple times during the season, especially if we're going into a period where we have uh, a little bit of cooler temperatures and rain. Just go over there and just do a light overseeding of, this, of the uh, lawn. That'll really thicken it up. But remember, it's always cool, dark, dry, where you need to supply, uh, store that seed, any seed, be it grass seed or anything, Cool, dark, dry. Cool, dark, dry. That's where you need to store. Uh, for your information, Robins loves grubs. That's from Marlene. Uh, of course, Robins are grubs are a protein source. Uh, so the reason why Robins, they, you know, they always say the early bird gets the worm. But I always say that poor worm, that early worm, man, that didn't work out for him so well. It's great if you're a bird. Another bad joke. Um, but yeah, they'll go and eat grubs as well because it is a protein source. They'll, use, they'll actually eat uh, cutworms as well. Uh, they'll eat uh, and many different other caterpillars. Birds will go out there and actually help with those populations as well. Uh, here we go with another question this morning. Hi, Frankie. Is it too late to split and divide coral bells and cat mint? Uh, Walker's low. That's Napia. Walker's low. Napia is uh, a tough plant. Go ahead, split that guy, no problem whatsoever. After it blooms, always cut it right back. That's the catnip, the walker's low. Cut it back because you'll get a second bloom. Coral bells, uh, you can divide it right now, but I would be more, I would be happier if you did that in late summer, early fall. 
that's when that would be better. But the coral, the catnip, very vigorous, easy plant. Uh, you can beat the hell out of that guy and, and go ahead. So once again, after that finishes blooming, that blue bloom, and that cat mint, that uh, Walker's Low is a beautiful plant. It's a really beautiful fl uh, filler plant. However, it can get really big and unruly as well. Uh, Wendy Wren, my dwarf irises did not bloom this year. Have they come to the end of their life or should I expose more roots? Thanks. So irises are just blooming now. Uh, Wendy, I don't know where you're, you are. Things are a little later. So, you know, maybe it just needs a little extra time. The irises, the corms of irises uh, over three to five years always need to be lifted and divided. That's a summer dividing that you're doing. So you're actually doing it after its bloom period. Um, if it's not performing well and you've had it for several years, it may be a time for you to go and lift those corms, those roots, and to section those corms off and then to do a replant. Um, I will be posting some information on that as well, but take a look at Royal Botanical Gardens website as well. They have a wonderful iris collection and they also have some great information on the division of irises as well. So there you go. Um, thanks, Frankie, about singing at all. I put Javix on it and it's still thriving. So the bleach uh, won't do as, so, you know, it's a non-selective herbicide. So some things that we're using for a non-selective herbicide is uh, we're trying to burn that, that plant. That's the other thing too. If you have stinging nettle, and let's say that we have any weeds that are growing in through interlock or on a driveway or in a garden with soil, a weed torch, my favorite tool I have, my favorite tool, you'll see videos on my Facebook page, is my weed torch. And that's simply a propane canister uh, attached to a long tube that at the end puts on a big flame and I burn the weeds. And in the interlocking patios, once you burn them once, it lasts for about three weeks, and then you come back and you have to burn them every once in a while. But it's a great way to do that. Um, but you can either use a non-selective herbicide, as I mentioned, uh, vinegar can work as well. And then that other option is using the, the burn torch as well. Um, we got another question here. Kelly Lynn, good morning, Frankie, from Brenton. Flower City. Last year, I got two rose bushes. You suggest, sadly, one has no green. Does it mean it's dead? Yes, quite possibly it does. Depends on where you bought the roses from. Uh, and most garden centers, some will have a six-month guarantee on roses. Uh, many will have a one to two-year guarantee on your roses. So check that out. Um, rose bushes, of course, if they're Floribundas, Hybrides, Grandifloras, a little bit more difficult because they're grafted and they usually have a higher um, rate of uh, not coming back the next year, but things like Canadian Explorer roses, uh, David Austin roses, uh, some of the North uh, 49th parallel roses from Vineland, those guys there are a little bit more hardy and better for you. So if it's not growing by this time, it's not going to come. It's not going to come. It's gone to the compost pile in the sky. Yes, it has. Uh, Deb, thank you. Deb, you're welcome. Uh, here we go as well. Just a little comment, Tracy. Happy Sunday from Perry Sound. Perry Sound, great places. How are the mosquitoes? How are the bugs in cottage country right now? That's my question. I haven't been up, so I have no idea. Uh, Michelle Logan. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning from Dunville. I love Dunville, Ontario. Uh, bunnies are eating my coral bells I planted two weeks ago. What can I do? Same thing with bunnies. You can actually spray them with, because that's the coral bells is not uh, an edible. You can use animal be gone. Uh, the other thing is sometimes a plastic owl put in the garden will distract things like bunnies from the area because uh, owls are predators to bunnies, but you got to move the owl around. Uh, even putting dog hair around the area where it's uh, the dogs, um, you know, bunnies sometimes will stay away, sometimes I say. Uh, and then uh, fencing, like a little bit of fencing around can help as well. Um, but those are some other options that you have for you. So animal will be gone. You have the plastic owl that you can put up. You can put something like dog hair down and then fencing that could go around as well. Um, Le Leonor or Leninor, Leninor, I guess so. Sometimes I don't say the names right. How do you uh, senate beets in your garden? Senate beets in your garden. Are you talking about separating the beets in your garden? Uh, you know what? I've never heard that term before. And there's sometimes where I get um, beets. Garden. So I'm just going to type it in here. Um, I don't know. Maybe I, you know what I think that is. Yeah, that's not Senate. <laughs> that's probably why I haven't heard that term. It's how do you separate beets in your garden? So yeah, you sow your line 
of your beats that are down. And then after you sew your line of beats, you need to do some spacing. Because if you're just doing beat tops, you can just keep them as is and just cut the beat tops and enjoy the beat tops. But if you want those beats to size up, then we got to separate and kind of create some space. And essentially what we're doing is with those beats that we're pulling, uh, they're done. So you're really just sacrificing some of those ones that we're starting, starting to um, thin. We're thinning the beats. That's the other term that we use. We're thinning. And by thinning, we're actually just, because once we pull that little beat, if you were to try to replant it, it wouldn't do well. Uh, you can try. You can try. Sometimes you have some success. But often when we're thinning, we're just uh, just getting rid of it. So there you go. That's why. I was like, send it your beats. I'm like, I didn't know that beats are political. You know, sometimes you got to beat politics. I didn't know the beats made it to Senate. Another bad dad joke. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Uh, Rita. Hi, Frankie. I have Swiss chard and spinach in my garden. And I can't identify what's eating the leaves. They're turning whitish gray, shriveling up. Thanks. So that is a leaf miner. Swiss chard leaf miner. So those leaves that are infected like that, I would pinch those off and then spray the remainder area with an insecticidal soap. If you want even put a floating bed sheet over that area. Okay. That's just a little bit higher than the plants themselves. That still allows the light in. So it'd be a white bed sheet. That's a floating row cover and that'll cut that down. Um, but those leaves that have been infected by that uh, leaf miner. So basically it's inside the leaf. So no type of uh, control method that we're going to use is going to work. We would need a systemic insecticide, but there are no health Canada approved systemic insecticides on the market. So just remove those leaves. And if you want Swiss chard leaf miner, uh, actually what I'll do is I'll just show you chard leaf miner as I'm typing it in here. Um, I'm just gonna pop up some images here. And for other people, this is why other people can take a look at what it looks like. Um, so I'm just gonna go here. I'm just gonna share my screen. I'm gonna go to a Chrome tab and then we're just gonna go here. So this is what Swiss chard leaf miner looks like. So you can see to the top left there, you can see how it kind of gets that grayish and then you can see how the leaf starts to fall apart. If you were to look closer, you could actually see where they burrow through. Um, and this is quite common. Um, uh, I had it last year quite bad, so bad that I didn't really have great success with Swiss chard. This year I've been really um, on top of it and they have been working out really well. So you, you can do way better with that. Here, I'm gonna stop sharing as well. There you go. So that's a little bit about Swiss chard leaf miner that's uh, there as well. So that's exactly what you have there. Um, another comment and question as well. Uh, this is from Sandra. During the storm a couple of weeks ago, my neighbor's tree branch, that was a terrible storm, fell on my established head. Looks like one of the cedars is broken. What should I do with it? When should I remove it and replace it with a new one? My neighbor suggested I leave it and see what happens. So if it's broken, what we have to do is cut the section of it that's broken off. If it's bent, snapped, uh, even if it looks like it's just curled, we got to cut that off a clean cut. Depends on uh, how long you want to wait. It will put a new leader up and will eventually fill in if it's still vibrant. Best thing for me to do, Sandra, is to take a look at that, uh, that broken section and that hedge as well. If you can email me, Frankie with an IE, Frankie with an IE at FrankieFlowers.com. Frankie with an IE at FrankieFlowers.com and send me a picture. Okay, Sandra, that'd be best. Um, good morning from Guelph. This is from Leslie or Leslie. Uh, a way to get rid of thistles growing in grad and taking over the flower beds. Growing in, I would assume, the garden. or it, So thistles, um, they're going to continue to grow. So the best way to do is to do that hand removal, which is a pain in the butt. Wear a pair of gloves when you're doing that. And then what you're doing in your garden is mulching. That mulching will really reduce that. A reminder, right now our gardens have not filled in, right? So uh, our perennials are still kind of growing. Our annuals, we just planted. Once our gardens start to fill in, there'll be less space for weed seeds to make contact with soil and less light down below to hit those weed seeds. So we're going to have less weeding as we work our way into the month of July and even less weeding in the month of August. We always have a little bit more weeding in May and in June because our gardens just haven't filled in and there's more space. How do we make sure that weed seeds don't make contact to soil? Mulch. That really helps out. So mulching is the best way. Is there anything else that you can use? Uh, you know, I already mentioned about a weed torch. If, it, if the thistles are coming through your interlock patio, you can use a weed torch. 
You can use some non-selective herbicides, make sure they're Health Canada approved. But when you're spraying a non-selective herbicide, you want to make sure that's not hitting other, any other plants in your garden. So you actually have to put a piece of cardboard down and spray towards the cardboard um, with the thistles. That's really important as well. Uh, and then a lot of the times it's just, they always say that gardeners have a cast iron back with a hinge in it. Because a lot of the times it just gets down to just good old weeding, trying to turn the garden of Eden into the garden of Eden. That's what we're always trying to do. Morning from Coburg. Question. None of my lavenders came back. All five plants are woody and no growth. The rest of the garden looks okay, uh, though. Thanks. So, Lori, um, you know, there are some seasons where lavender, depending upon the variety, there's multiple varieties of lavender, multiple varieties. And depending upon the hardiness zone of that lavender, and a reminder, lavender actually likes a well-drained soil. Actually, it doesn't like to be in too rich of a soil. It almost wants to be in more of a rocky type soil. So if it went into uh, winter sitting overly wet, it actually had a deep freeze, maybe didn't have enough snow load over it, it could have died back. So next time when you go to purchase more lavender, really pay attention to the variety, the hardiness zone, and make sure it fits your, number one, your hardiness zone, and then your soil type as well. Super important that's there. Uh, you do get some, some loss. You will get loss, and lavender is one of those perennial herb type plants where you can get loss for sure. Um, this is, this is what I love about the community. Another shout out when we see, if you see a garden question there that, you know, the answer in the comments, I encourage you to go out there and share your thoughts because sometimes your thoughts, when I read the comments, I can even learn from them, but as well, this is a community about we're helping all each other to have better gardens, have some fun and really go out there and explore and learn. That's the benefit of gardening. And I just can't get to answer to all the questions. This is from a reply from Kelly to Vicky. I had the same thing last year and the lady suggested orange pills and it totally worked. Orange pills, if we're talking about repelling cats, orange pills, the smell of citrus can be really good for keeping cats out of your garden because they don't like the smell of citrus. And sometimes zesting those orange pills, so not just laying the orange pill out, but kind of zesting a few of them around will really work for you as well. Orange pills will not work as well for squirrels. So it depends. That's why trying to figure out what they don't like to see, what they don't like to touch, what they don't like to taste, what they don't like to hear. Those are what they don't like to feel. Cats hate the feeling of anything on their paws. So even sometimes just putting a little bit of rock mulch in will keep cats out of the garden. Remember when my cats go in your garden, they're like that nice soft soil. They're like, oh, this is a great place to go to the bathroom. Let's go to the bathroom here. And that's what happens uh, with those cats. Um, this is a, a question, I think, uh, from Dale. I'm working on a lady's garden. It's infested with grass. After nine hours of removing all of it, however, there are still roots. What can I do to stop the grass from regrowing? Help. So, Dale, you're going to try to remove as much of that grass as possible. So you're going to try to remove as much as the roots and whatnot. And sometimes it's about digging out <clears throat> the plants that are good in that garden. So if it's a perennial garden, removing those plants out and then digging out the garden, trying to dig out the roots and then replanting the perennials and then mulching in. It's a bigger project, but it works, but it's, it's a matter of constant removal and mulching that's going to be, and you will get root growth that comes back in over time. It's just not a quick fix. This is something that takes over a few times. So if it's a client that you're working on, Dale, you have to say to that client, <clears throat> be upfront and say, Hey, you have a very weed infested garden. This is not going to be a one-time clean. This is going to take me a little bit of time to get this under control. It's been left for so long, but a matter of hand removal of those weeds and then trying to get as many roots, mulching into those areas, and then coming back in two weeks, removing again, coming back in two weeks and removing again. It's not an easy thing, and it does take time. That's why with the garden, man, like I always say to people, if you go by your garden, you're like, oh, there's a few weeds. I'll get back to that next week. I'll weed it next week. If you see a few weeds, you have a little bit of time, <clears throat> go out there and pull those weeds because those weeds will drop seeds. And if you come back in a week, there's going to be more weeds, more work. So if you can just kind of devote a little bit of time to weed, I weeded my gardens yesterday, went through, did a bunch of it, weeded, watered, did some deadheading on some medallias uh, within an hour. Boom, 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 boom. Done, nice and clean. And I'm keeping on top of the weeds. If I didn't, then I'd be behind the eight ball. Uh, okay, so we already saw that one. Uh, we got uh, Buongiorno this morning. Uh, Frankie, I've added a few more pots to my veggie garden this year. And I'm wondering if I can reuse this year's potting mix next year. 
So what I would do is the, I would use, I would put a third of new fresh soil. So two thirds, you can use of old soil, one third of fresh. If any of those pots have any disease on them, get rid of that soil, right? Because we want to make sure we're starting fresh next season. And if we had diseased soil, well, diseased plants, the, uh, the little spores of those disease of that disease could sit in that soil. So we're cleaning it up. But if not, you can use uh, just refreshing some of the soil up. And you'll see that those the potting soil in the soil will actually sink a little bit, but just kind of remove a little bit and freshen it up. Uh, we got another thank you that's happening. And I'm going to do one more question here, guys. Uh, and we're going to go to this one here. <clears throat> Good morning, Frankie. I have a plant indoors and she gets white dusty, it's uh, dusty on the leaves and they are not looking good. I leave it on the basement, but they are in the window. They look like they're getting sick. That's from Maria. So Maria, that is powdery mildew. So powdery mildew is uh, when you have poor air circulation, high humidity, something like that. So any of those badly infected leaves, I would just remove them, but wash your hands after with bleach, discard those in the garden. Get a fungicide. So you can go to your local garden center and or Home Hardware, Home Depot, Lowe's, Canadian Tire, any of those places. And you're going to look for a green container that's a garden fungicide. So you're going to go where all the different things are used to control bugs. And you're going to get a garden fungicide. And then you're going to apply that garden fungicide and that should clean that up for you. So once again, that's powdery mildew, indoor plants that you had. So for all those that joined me today, um, and there are right now a bunch that are online this morning that said hello, and I just hope that you guys have a fantastic Sunday. Get out, enjoy the sunshine. I'm going to go grab some plants now for the community garden that we're doing at Yorkdale tomorrow on Breakfast Television. I'm going to go to Bradford Greenhouse Garden Gallery. If you haven't planted your vegetables yet, go there. There's lots of selection, lots going on, uh, lots of plants. Go to the garden center, say hello. And if you go to the Bradford store, say hello to my Uncle Sam and tell him that Frank sent you. Yeah, tell him Frank. If you go to the berry store, say hello to my Aunt Eileen or my Uncle Len. Tell him Frank sent you. Okay, guys, take care, guys. Uh, and remember, a reminder, gardening is way better, way better than therapy. No, I'm just joking. But I say gardening is better than therapy because at the end, you feel good and you get tomatoes. And you can make sauce. Sometimes in life, you just got to make some sauce. Okay, guys.